Hi everyone, this is Shashwat DC here from the Research Center at the Azim Premji University. I welcome you all to Nature Writing for Children, a webinar series launched under the Seeking Sustainability Initiative of the University. Through this series, what we essentially want to do is broad base the discussion about nature writing, nature, children, you know, sustainability, environmentalism, and all these topics. You see, over the past couple of years, while the discussion about you know terms like global warming and climate change has become very ubiquitous, it has largely been you know uh, centered around very empirical and uh, dark discussion, scientific and you know very much uh, empirical in nature. What we want to do through this series is bring the emotional context into this discussion. What really happens is, you know, as it has happened in the past, what has, you know, people have been talking about nature, but they have been talking about it from a very external point of view. They talk about nature as if it's an externality. We are not really part of it. And this has been largely because Today, we live in cities which are very much you know, disconnected from nature per se. Whatever nature that is there is in terms of parks and zoos and in that sense. The best way to you know, kind of bridge this gap is through literature and uh, you know, writings. And what has also been there is you know, the best audience for that is children. Through this series, we have been talking about authors who have written for children, who have been you know, uh, writing books for, on nature and for children, and they have been talking about the subject in a very you know uh, unique manner and we had you know up till now four sessions of this where we had numerous guests coming on and talking about their books today's discussion is very unique because we have someone who's not really a nature writer per se he's a children's author who has written numerous books uh, numerous poetry books uh, on as interesting topics as you know my cat knows karate or my hippo has hiccups he's a former u.s children's poet laureate and his works have been published in numerous you know, textbooks all across the globe. In fact, my own uh, introduction to him was through a, you know, the, the textbook of my son. So it has been a very you know, interesting moment of discovery. And uh, Ken Nisbeth is, is joining us from Mexico. And uh, a very warm welcome to you, Ken. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes, and it's very unique as well because you're joining us on what we call in India as your very happy Wala birthday. So many, many happy returns of the day. How old are you, Ken, right now? Uh, I, today, I am 59 years old. Okay. Then or, that's... or as I often tell children, I'll say I am 59 million years old. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's very interesting way to put it. And it's a very, I'm very glad that you're you're spending such a you know important day with us and talking about something very you know very interesting. So you have been writing about uh, you know motives of children, poetry, and all. To begin with, let's just start this conversation. Yes. The past yes. one year has been very interesting and challenging. So how have you spent the you know the year 2020, and how has that year been for you? Well, in terms of in terms of my writing, uh, it's been pretty much the same. As writers tend to work uh, alone, uh, often from home, and so none of that has changed. Uh, a, a couple of things have changed. One is that uh, I normally do oh four, fifty or sixty in person. Uh, uh, school visits where I do writing workshops, uh, assembly programs for kids, and of course, all of that has gone completely virtual. So, uh, and, and in, the, in, in the past years, what, where I've done 35, 40 virtual school presentations, this year I may be doing 100. And um, aside from that, the, I, I uh, decided it was time to learn another language. So I spent the last year learning Portuguese and uh, this year I'll, I'll be moving on to Spanish and then I think next year I'm going to I'm going to uh, try out an Asian language. I don't know which one yet. We can suggest Hindi for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So let's let's start. You know, to begin with, uh, you have you have made a very uh, whatever reading that we have done is you have made an accidental foray into the world of poems. You know, just give a glimpse of your life before you started rhyming. Oh well. Oh. Um, Hmm. 
Uh, how far back should I go? <laughs> I, I guess I, I guess I should tell you that as a, as a child, I loved uh, initially I loved listening to poems, Mother Goose, uh, Dr. Seuss's books, that sort of thing, uh, and then and then when I was maybe nine years old or so, my father would would recite a lot of poems. My father had memorized many, many, especially narrative poems. Um, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, uh, uh, Casey at the Bat, the, those sorts of things. And he would, he would recite a poem and I would just be enraptured to the point where when I was oh, maybe 12 years old, I started going to the library looking for uh, fun poetry that I could read. Uh, and what I came across then, because I'm old, was Lewis Carroll, uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, Through the Looking Glass, and each of those books has about a dozen poems in them, and I would memorize them. But even then, it never occurred to me to try writing a poem of my own. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't start that until I was in my 30s. So in between there, I had a career as a computer programmer. Uh, software developer. I had my own company for about a decade. I worked for Microsoft when I was writing my first poems. And so that naturally in the 1990s, when I was starting to write poetry and the World Wide Web was, was a new thing on the internet, uh, I decided to create a, a children's poetry website and it has just grown into the, the, um, the, the biggest, most visited children's poetry web website on the internet. And that's, that's where a lot of uh, uh, Indian children and Indian textbook publishers find out about my work is through my website. And there you go. Yeah. That's yeah, poetryforkids.com. Yes, of course, it's one of the most visited sites. And it's, a, it's an enormous resource on poetry and, you know, the subject of poetry and how to write them. Uh, you know, coming to the, uh, you have been writing prolific books over the past couple of years. So how do you just keep those engines running? Oh, uh, well, one, one thing is I, I sort of, I have a personal commitment to publish a new poem on my website every week. So I, I, am, I force myself at a minimum to write a new poem every single week. Uh, oftentimes I'm writing more than that because I also write commission piece, pieces for publishers um, or maybe I just have more more ideas and so I just I just keep writing. And and the titles of the book have been very interesting. So if you can just give a brief you know a brief uh, idea about how how did you come across these you know my cat knows karate or the you know <laughs> well the hips are having hiccups. Uh, for the longest time, it, it was not up to me to choose the title of the book. That was always selected by the publisher. And uh, so my first book was called The Aliens Have Landed at Our School. And I had nothing to do with that title. And then my second book was all school poems, and it was called When the Teacher Isn't Looking. And, and these titles were chosen by the publishers. Uh, lately, I have been able to select the titles of my own books, and I, so I choose, usually it's the title of one of my poems, and I, I try to choose a title that is engaging and exciting uh, for my eight-year-old, nine-year-old audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just tell me, you you before before you started writing poetry at uh, you know by the age of thirties, you have been a computer. Did poetry come naturally to you? Was it a natural thing, or you actually worked hard to you know kind of imbue that uh, that uh, that art? Both. Both. It, I won't say that it, it came naturally any more than say if you decided to take up skateboarding, you know it it's it's not so much whether it's not feels it feels natural it's whether you you have an internal drive to do it and i definitely had that drive to do it and not just to write but to learn how to write to get better and better at it so in addition to writing poetry for the first 10 years i studied poetry 
I studied uh, rhythm and meter and uh, uh, various poetic techniques that that uh, I could employ in my writing. Uh, I I read a lot of poetry and asked what was going on in their in their writing and their word choice and tried to incorporate some of that into my own writing. Yes. And where would you fit your genre of writing, the rhymes and the where, where would exactly your poetry fall into that, you know? <laughs> well, I, I don't know that there is a genre per se other than humorous poetry for children. Uh, but I would say that it falls into the same category as uh, poets such as uh, Shel Silverstein, Jack Perlutsky, uh, here in the United States, there was a very popular, although not for children, there was a very popular poet in the 20th century named Ogden Nash. Um, yes. And so in, in that category, if you go back, if you go back 150 years, uh, there was a, there was a poet, uh, named William Brighty Rands, British poet who inspired some of these other poets I mentioned and. I'm just following along in that in that same tradition. Um, yeah, so there we yeah. Pe so, people have been doing this for a long time and I'm just yeah. I'm just the next Yeah. Know, so so if you, if you if if you notice you know we have been uh, our introduction to uh, you know these kind of humorous poetry is what we used to call limericks if we, uh, we were exposed to oh, our Yes. yes. So, in that sense, your your poetry really reminds us to that. But it has a very very uh, nice structure and uh, you know very interesting read to it. So, stepping across in in that sense, stepping across from you know just writing books and all, you have been also prolific in spreading the knowledge and the art of poetry writing itself through your website poetryforkids.com. As as you mentioned earlier, it was one of the most earliest websites when this whole uh, uh, the World Wide Web was coming along. So, mm -hmm. what was the genesis? What has been the idea, and how you have been, you know, how you have been keeping it along for, you know, keeping it alive for so many years now, two decades over two decades. Now. Well, you see, in addition to writing my books, one of the things that I have been doing over the last twenty-five years is working with kids, with children in schools, uh, doing writing workshops and other presentations. And so a lot of the things that I have learned in not just how to write poetry, but how to teach poetry writing, I've wanted to share that knowledge on my website as well. So a teacher can, can have her students uh, read a poetry writing lesson on my website and then use that to write a poem of their own. And part of the reason I'm doing this is, as I said, when I was when I was 10, 12 years old, I did not know that you could make up your own poems, nor did I have any idea how one would go about it. And so I, I want to change that for kids today. I want kids to know that poems are written by real people and uh, it, it's not that hard to do if you just know a few little tricks and uh, because I want to encourage them not only to read, but I want to encourage them to uh, uh, to to actually have a reason to want to write. Mm -hmm. And what has been your, so if we talk about your, your, your website has been very uh, extensive in terms of the resources that you offer to people right in terms of, you know, helping them with rhyming words and everything. So how many poems have you posted on your website for all these years? Uh, wow. Wow. Good question. I, I have I've written more than about 1500 poems. I believe there are just a little more than 800 on the website right now, maybe 820 something like that. I'd have to actually go look and count, but more, more than 800 on, are on the website. And which of your poem uh, you know would be the most popular one out there which gets oh, more This is surprising because I'm so on my website, I not only let kids read the poems, I let them grade them. I let them rate the poems. Yeah, one to five stars. And for for uh, for about four years now, the most popular poem on my website has been the poem, My Cat Knows Karate. But about a month ago, I wrote a poem called, I Made a Meme This Morning. Okay. And 
that one by far has knocked my cat nose karate out of first place okay okay that's interesting i would love if you if you could uh, you know possibly read that to us it would be a very interesting one oh of course i would love to and i i'll tell you i read this to my wife and she said oh you're going to get in trouble for that and i said why am i going to get in trouble and she said well because you know you're um it's it's uh, you're setting up unrealistic expectations for the children who are reading it and i said well maybe maybe that's true but really this is more about uh, childhood fantasy right so when i was a when i was a child i would fantasize about being a superhero and being able to fly uh and and that sort of thing and and I'm not saying kids don't still have those same fantasies, but they have different fantasies now. And and this is uh, perhaps one of them, and that might explain why it's such a popular poem. So here is, I made a meme this morning. I made a meme this morning. I posted it online. I asked my mom's permission. She said that it was fine. The next, um, then people started sharing it. The next thing that I knew, my meme had spread around the world. It grew and grew and grew. By lunch, my meme went viral. It had a billion views. By dinner time, the TV had it on the evening news. I earned a penny, maybe two, from every single share. And by the time I went to bed, I was a millionaire. I thought of making one more meme that might go even higher, but nah, I'm nearly nine years old. I think I'll just retire. Fascinating, fascinating. That's, that's as you said, that's so much uh, glued on to the times that we live in today, right? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If you are, uh, you know, if you're 10 years old, this idea of um, creating something that goes viral, uh, perhaps a, a meme that suddenly makes you famous. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty attractive fantasy. Yeah. So, so in a very uh, interesting sense, your uh, poetry on meme, meme, which talks about going viral, has gone viral itself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yes. about that, but. Yes. So let, let's let's you know let's uh, move to the topic of education. While you're about goal has been to entertain and enable kids to have fun and much of your poetry is direct, uh, directed towards that what are your views on education and the importance of it oh, oh well i'm sure that well I, sh I should preface this by saying i am not a teacher okay i have i have spent the last 25 years educating children but i am not a teacher i am good for education i don't know uh, all the ins and outs of education, and and I really want to say, I have so much respect for teachers. Um, you know, I get to I get to walk into a school and entertain kids and get them really excited and having lots of fun, and then I just leave and hand them back. Whereas the teachers are working with the same children with the same issues day in and day out, and that is something I could never do. In a way, I'm I'm more like um, I I am to uh, teachers what grandparents are to parents, if that makes sense. So, so, but, but, so that with that huge preface, let me say my view on education is that I'm sure you've heard the, the analogy of uh, it's, it's not about filling a bucket, it's about lighting a fire, right? That you know it's it's easy to it's easy to fall into this idea that uh, the 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 job of an educator is to uh, is to impart our knowledge right to share with kids everything that we know and and just overload them with information so that they understand the world but my personal view is that that's unnecessary what what we as educators need to do is to inspire kids to want to find out for themselves. And then it's, 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 if, a, if a child asks you a question, what is this, how does this work? 
that Im that implies that they are curious about it and it's not just you telling them something that they don't care about so as a writer my goal is to inspire children to want to read and i do that by by giving them short little poems one page two pages that are going to make them smile make them laugh make them want to read another one now along the way they're going to uh, they're going to be exposed to vocabulary and ideas and perspectives that they wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise but those ideas are not the primary thing as far as i'm concerned they're they're a, a secondary benefit uh, to me the primary benefit is uh, this i find is a really good way of turning children into lifelong readers and lifelong learners and perhaps even writers very interesting you know, typically what happens is when when children education is uh, there's a lot of emphasis that is laid about you know the terminology that gets used that the kind of you know vocabulary that is being introduced to them and also the the length of you know uh, in our times when we were you know when we were learning poems and poetry and prose it was usually the poems used to be of very much uh, you know long length and we had to learn them by rote in in that context when we compare your poetry it's very easy to you know kind digest palatable and very short and snappy so is there a conscious effort that you make towards you know kind of you know not writing long poems and keeping them to within some certain size limits not necessarily uh, for me for me a poem uh, each poem is only as long as it needs to be you know i may write a poem that it's only 2 3 4 lines long or i may write a poem that's 100 lines long it's just whatever is required to tell that story or to uh, get that idea across or tell that joke whatever it is i'm trying to accomplish so uh i do find that most of my poems tend to fall somewhere between about 12 and 32 lines long roughly uh but that's not that's not intentional i i will go shorter or longer if the subject dictates how how does this inspiration of your poems comes along is it, is it just natural and you write it in a flow or you know you kind of go back and forth on it at times <laughs> well, what what i do is i just pay attention all the time and uh you know if someone says something like um The other day I was I was uh having a conversation with uh uh some some people at a publishing company and at the end of our conversation I said that I was going to go watch the uh the Mars lander that NASA was landing on Mars this is what two two days ago and uh one of these one of the editors at this publishing company said that she was going to go watch Arsenal football And I said, "Oh. Well, there we go. I just now I need to write a poem about Martian football." So the the ideas are are there, you but but you have to not only grab them, but then not lose them. And so what I do is I keep a folder of ideas on my phone, and whenever something like that comes up, I just jot it down. I might just write something as simple as Martian football. And then now in my folder, let me see if I can count. I currently have 181 notes of ideas in my folder so that when I when it comes time to write, I just open up that folder and I look for things that I feel like working on. Uh the mo most recent one, I think I wrote this yesterday, was have you ever had a dream in which you thought you were awake? Now that's that's the whole idea. I don't know where that's going. uh except i also thought of the ending of the poem and the the last line is uh that's the dream you're having now <laughs> uh and so you know maybe, maybe i will write that poem sometime yeah and hopefully when we read it we'll kind of relate it that we heard it in this webinar out here there you go yes so also in your poems you know you have many times used animal motif and helping kids learn about them Mm -hmm. So is it a conscious effort or it just comes naturally animals are you know pretty funny for you Well uh, 
I'm I'm actually I'm actually quite aware of uh, I I have to be cautious when I'm writing because I have an I have a worldwide audience so I have uh, I have fans in pretty much every country in the world and I and I have to be conscious of the fact that let's say that I'm writing about pets I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that uh, children in Hong Kong don't normally have pets the way they do here in America. Um, but in terms of, you know, when I put an animal in a poem, it when or why I do it just depends on the context. Uh, for example, I have a poem called My Chickens on the Internet. And that was a, um, uh, that had to be a chicken because the the joke was that my it, my chicken hasn't learned how to type yet. She can only she can only hunt and peck, uh, and I just wanted to get that that pun across of hunting and pecking is a chicken thing, but it's also a keyboard thing. You have you have spoken about a lot of pets and all. Do you personally have pets? I do. I do. Uh, I have I have two two cats. Uh, okay. They're, one of them is twenty years old. Uh, he's, or as, as, as his veterinarian says, he's 150 and, uh, then, and his name is Thomas. And then we have another cat named Sancho, uh, who is a one year old kitten and uh, Sancho got his name because from, from Sancho Panza in Don Quixote, because he's, he's Thomas, yeah. Thomas's little sidekick. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So there. And and is, is, is your cat the one that gave you inspiration for the, uh, you know, the cat knows karate? <laughs> um, no, no, that was, so my cat knows karate is a poem about all of my pets and, and all of the different martial arts that they have learned by watching television. And that, um, I think that idea simply came about because I had written a book called The Armpit of Doom. And then I wrote a sequel called The Biggest Burp Ever. And I, and I noticed that I had a, a inadvertently established a pattern there. The, the armpit was A, the biggest burp was B. So I knew I had to write a C book and the book was pretty much done. But I just kept thinking, you know, what am I going to write that starts with a C? And so it, my brain kept coming back to cat, but I wanted my cat to be doing something, something really outrageous. Um, you know, whether my cat was an astronaut or, you know, something that cats don't ordinarily do. And I fell upon this alliteration of my cat knows karate. And, and I just, so, so it actually, the idea for the poem simply came from that title, which I wanted to use as the title of the book. Very interesting, very interesting. And also, uh, while, while you have penned a lot of these, uh, you know, animal morph tales and, you know, these poems which have a lot of interesting, uh, you know, events occurring in them, there's also been an element of, you know, where you have spoken about conservation related issues like recycling or saving water. How mm -hmm. important do you think are these topics uh, when it comes to, you know, kind of taking them on on poetry or for kids? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think they're, I think they're not just very important. I think they're critical um, that, you know, children need to need to know that the world is um, is ours to care for, you know, that we can we can turn the world into a, a garbage heap uh, or or we can take take good care of it and have an uh, abundant resources. And so that that is very important. But to the extent that I address it in my writing, I am not going to ever tackle it head on. I'm never going to write a book about um, about uh, not using plastic bags, right? But I might address uh, the the you know something about plastic bags versus reusable bags in a poem, but in a humorous way, not in a didactic way. Right, because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to tell kids uh, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to, to, to say, come with me. Let's have fun. 
Tell me one thing, would that be a difficult thing? Because with the example that you shared about plastic, right? when you're talking about plastic per se, it would naturally come to you to you know, be, you know, tell children what to do and what not to do. And that's typically the, 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 the guidance framework that we work in. So how do you curb those kind of, you know, tendencies? <laughs> well, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm just simply not telling children what to do. I, I am not interested in filling that bucket. I am interested in lighting a fire. And I don't think that, I, I just don't think there's any value in telling kids, don't do that, right? I think there is value in saying, hey, look at this. Let's go have an adventure. And then learning along the way, right? If you, um, if you go to the forest, uh, you can say, you can tell kids, you know, uh, don't don't drop that candy bar wrapper, you know, or you can say, oh, look at this habitat, you know, oh, look, at here's the here are turtles and frogs over here. And and then use that as a way to have them learn organically. You don't drop that candy bar wrapper where those turtles and frogs live. I hope that makes sense. So yes, just to emphasize that point, I, I would request you if you could share one of those poems on these, you know, these themes that you have kind of written on conservation or something. They're very interesting poems that I've seen. Oh, sure. Uh, well, I, I think uh, one we should start with is um, a poem called My Frog Recycles All His Trash. Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, this is not intended to be a poem about saying saying you should recycle this is a poem to make kids laugh and maybe just maybe in the process get them thinking about recycling while they're at it so here is my frog recycles all his trash my frog recycles all his trash he eats organic food he cares for the environment He's quite the hipster dude. Reduce, reuse, recycle is the motto of my frog. He drives a solar powered car to cut back on the smog. He helps endangered species and opposes climate change. He knows that since he's just a frog, this might seem kind of strange, but still he does his very best to keep our planet clean. He thinks it's only natural. He's proud of being green. <laughs> that's 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 so so yeah. As you said, you have you've touched upon so many of these you know keywords that we call them, right? And you have done it in a manner which has not been very didactic and pedantic in that sense. Right, and and so if if a child reads this poem, uh, you know, at first they might just latch on to the um, the double entendre of being green. What does that mean? Uh, but in the process of reading the poem, they may encounter some uh, vocabulary or concepts that they weren't familiar with previously. So. Um, you know whether it's whether it's organic food or uh, solar power or reduce, reuse, recycle. And so at that point, they may ask an adult, "What is what does this mean? Reduce, reuse, recycle." So what I've done is hopefully instilled a little curiosity in them so that they explore their own world, that they begin asking questions rather than just having adults saying, "Okay, now you need to learn about this." And, and in that sense, uh, so uh, when we talk about, as, as I said earlier, when we talk about the subject of climate change or global warming, it's rather serious and dark. How do you think poetry can, you know, kind of um, enliven it in that sense? <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, I mean, that's, that's not what I'm here for. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure it can. And you know what? I have, I have many, many friends who write poetry specifically about the natural world. Uh, you know, they might write an entire book of poems about uh, animals that live in the Arctic, right? Or a, an entire book of poems about the water cycle or, or something like this. And um, I, I don't have the attention span for that. I, 
I just want to go from one joke to the next, and and some of them may may be useful for uh, for for teaching you know specific environmental concepts. And so, just just for example, you know, you you have been a very big votary of you know rhyming and the meter that you have been teaching through your through your website as well. So, for instance. If you were to take the words like sustainability and climate change, how do what words would rhyme with those kind of things? If someone was to attempt it, <laughs> well, uh, you know, here's something that has surprised me, and that is uh, on my website. In addition to the poems and the writing lessons and so forth, I I have a rhyming dictionary for children, and using that rhyming dictionary, uh, you could type in sustainability. And it would give you a list of every word that rhymes with it, or you could type in change, and it would give you, you know, strange and range and and so forth. And what really surprises me is that's actually one of the most used pages on my website. Mm -hmm. I think partly because it is a it is a child friendly rhyming dictionary, so you're not going to uh, have any any uh, surprise words that. Uh, that you might get from a from a standard rhyming dictionary, uh, but but uh, but these are these are easy words to rhyme. Let me think for a second. So sustainability would rhyme with anything that ends with illity, right? Um, um, agility, ability, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, futility, and so forth. Um, uh, the only difficult one there would be the word environment, yes. and the reason is that. Rhymes, rhymes aren't just that they end with the same sound, but they end with the same sound beginning with the final stressed syllable. And the final stressed syllable in environment is that vi syllable. So there aren't, as far as I know, there aren't any other words that end with ironment. But you could, you could fudge it by just rhyming something, something else that ends with ent, right? Ent, okay, uh, yes. Yeah. S spant bent right environment it's yes. it's a it's a little bit of a little bit of a hint, but close enough interesting so if if i i were to ask you if there if there are a lot many i'm, I'm sure there are a lot many educators and writers who are watching this and you know would be checking on the on the uh, conversation that we are having if you were to give them a you know kind of a uh a, series of how how to write a book if you can just throw the some notes at them if they want to write for children and how how can they incorporate the topic of nature writing in them and not make it didactic as you say it mm -hmm. what what should be the things that they can do oh well it, you know it, it really depends on what kind of a book they're writing you know if they're writing an adventure story that's going to be different than they're right if they're writing uh, poems uh or non-fiction for example um, but I, I think the, the important thing as a writer is to think about your audience. You know, who are you writing for? And how, not, just, not just what do you want to tell them, but how are they going to read it? How are they going to perceive it? How are they going to take it in? And so let's say that you want to, uh, you want to cover the idea of, of, um, I don't know, uh, plastic, let's go back to plastic. The idea of, you know, of plastic in a, in a chapter book for children. Well, the plastic is not the important thing. The important thing is the, the engaging story that kids want to read and they want to follow and they want to find out what's gonna happen next. The plastic can be a motif that's used throughout uh, throughout the story, but making it the centerpiece of the story, now you're being didactic. Okay, okay, that's interesting. And so, for instance, I, there's an interesting poem that you, I, one of my personal favorite as well is the one on no more water. Now, water is a very <laughs> important issue that we have, you know, across the world, and we we have there's a lot of awareness happening in. You know, when we talk about the topic of water, not only in India, but across the world, we, we have, you know, in Africa where cities are going out of water. Mm -hmm. In that sense, 
that poem presents the whole concept in a very unique way so if you could just you know share your thoughts on that poem and possibly even i'd request you to you know share that poem with us by in your reading in your inimitable style that you have right well as i as i mentioned just a moment ago i think it's important as a writer to uh, to know who your audience is and how they are going to perceive what you're saying now for and and, and a lot of my writing the ideas come from my own childhood. So, for example, when I was a child, one of the things I remember a lot was my parents telling me to turn off the lights, right, and turn off the water. So you, you would leave the water running, and then your parents were right there saying, you can't leave the water running, you have to turn it off. Um, my father went so far one year as to tell us that... Um, to encourage us to turn off the lights, he said, I'm going to look at the electric bill and whatever money we save on the electric bill this year from last year, I will give to you for Christmas. Well, OK. Yeah, it, it didn't it didn't work. The electric bill was higher that year. But uh, but but you get the idea. This is something from from my own childhood. And so I wrote this poem, No More Water, about uh, about my parents telling me to turn the water off and uh, something unexpected happens. So here here is no more water. Both my parents told me not to, but I did it anyway. Now our water tank is empty and the well ran dry today. Not a drop is in the reservoir. The lake's completely dry. Everybody's getting thirstier and I'm the reason why. All the rivers are depleted. All the streams no longer flow. All the seas and all the oceans are devoid of H2O. No, there isn't any water. Not a drop is left to drink because I left the faucet running and it all went down the sink. Fascinating. Fascinating. See, again, that, that and this poem was written long back, if I'm not wrong, right? Oh, yes. This is one of the earliest poems I had ever written. It was published in my first book in 2001, but I probably wrote this poem around 1996 or 1997, something like that. Interesting. And it's only now that we are getting around to the uh, fact that we are t telling children to close their faucets and not to waste too much of water, right? Right. Well, <laughs> my, my father was telling us that back in the 1960s. And I don't think, in this case, I don't think it was that uh, they were concerned about the environment. I think they were concerned more about the water bill. <laughs> that is also, yeah. No, but yeah, so so yes, yes. So in that sense, you're bringing that 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 knowledge that was there, the practical knowledge that was there, and making it much more, you know, uh, broad based and popular right now. Mm -hmm. Well, and well, and I'm doing it in a way I think that is accessible to children because you know children have this rich, rich fantasy life where things that adults know are impossible are uh, are you know fodder for their imagination uh like you know well i can i not only can i jump i can jump 50 feet in the air so i clearly this poem is hyperbole but it, it it's a it's cartoon humor right yeah and you also have this thing about you you have these programs running with a lot of tools all across the globe right and you you have, you have you make visits and right now in the past year you made a lot of virtual visits so what has been uh, the kind of response that you've got from the kids how do they take to you are you like that you know one <laughs> imaginative you know uh, kind oh, of they love it they love it I, I, oh uh, trust me i have had so many kids ask if they can if they can come live with me instead of their their parents or you know they uh kindergartners kindergartners after i do a program they just come running up to me and throw their arms around me like oh you're so fun uh, but of course, what they don't realize, they 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 think that my house must just be a barrel full of monkeys. That we're we're just having a great time and laughing all the time. They don't realize that I'm putting on a show for them, right? Uh, real life I, at my house, we're still washing the dishes and sweeping the floors and paying the bills. 
Yes, and not only your poems, but you have also, you know, developed a very innovative style of, you know, kind of, you know, uh, the theatrical style of expressing them. I, I see a lot of your videos, which is very, you have this persona about that. And so how have you done that? What has been the, you know? Oh, well, I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm of the opinion that any poem can be improved by just putting some, adding some people running and screaming into it. Um, I mean, if, you, if you're writing over, right, uh, I want I want things to be exciting. Uh, for example, I'm working on I'm working on a new book right now. And there's a poem that I wrote that I absolutely love. And it's called The Weather is Perfect for Running. And it's a poem about how uh, you you have grand ambitions, but then you realize, well, maybe that's a little too much. So I'll scale back my ambition a little bit. Instead of going for a run, I'll walk the dog. Uh, but even that's a little bit too much. I don't really want to do that because the dog's kind of hyper. So I think I'll just uh, stay here and pet the cat. And eventually, I'm I'm asleep on the couch. And I love the joke, but it's it's not particularly appealing to kids because it doesn't have any excitement. So I've replaced that poem in the book with a, a new poem called The Football Game is on TV, in which everybody in the house is running around screaming, tearing their hair out, crying uh, about the football game. Um, and, and it's just, it's more appealing to, to uh, young readers. Yes, that's interesting. And are you surprised by the kind of, you know, the, the kind of uh, popularity that you have all across uh, the globe right now? You, your poems are being read in textbooks and everywhere, right? Uh, I find it very surprising, yes, because you, you have to realize that I never intended to become a poet or an author. Um, I just started writing poems for my own amusement because it, it was fun. I enjoyed doing it. But I enjoyed it enough that within a, within just a few short years, I have got a, a book published and another book published. And so for me, to answer your question, this is uh, to, to see a, such a reaction to what I consider more or less a hobby is, is yeah, overwhelming. I would I would call it a passion for you. But the way that you have been, yeah. It, yeah, the way you have been promoting the whole. It's not only you writing it, but also the fact that you're promoting the art itself, the uptake of its art through your through your website and everything. That's very interesting. You know, we are already having a lot of fans of yours in India. So, have you had any interaction with Indian kids and Indian? I see there's one Ekta Batra who says that one of her favorite poems is "If I Were the Principal." If I were the yeah. principal, nice, nice. That is a that is a wonderful poem about uh, if if I if I were the principal, we would change everything. You know, we would we would learn how to surf on waterfalls, and we would learn how to build time machines, and and you know, just fun stuff. Yes. So so, so yes, I, I have a yes. lot of I have a lot of fans in in India and. All over the world, I I have done I have done many virtual presentations for schools in India, um, and uh, I've I've been to India and I've I've actually done in person uh, programs for for students there. Um, but yeah, I think India after after the U.S. and the U.K. I think India may be my my third uh, largest fan base. Yes, and even on the YouTube, when the when your poems are being read, except by you, I see a lot of Indian kids reading those poems. Mm -hmm. So, do you watch those? Do you watch those fan videos yourself? Oh, I do, I do. Although I don't always know, you know, I, I don't have any mechanism by which I can say, "Oh, look, somebody posted a new fan video." Uh, so, what I what I will do is occasionally I will go to YouTube and just type in my own name to see what comes up. And uh, yeah, and sometimes sometimes it's just a, a child in front of a camera reading a poem, but more often, more often it may be a, um, uh, a recitation contest at school where it's a, a, a child on, on stage or perhaps a classroom where we have a bunch of students reading poems. And 
it does i guess in a way it does surprise me how many of them are are from india yes <laughs> that's but, interesting yeah it's nice so I, I yeah so that's i guess your poems uh, since they are there in the textbooks we get uh, the kids get exposed to them a lot early and that's where they take them up there's one more interesting thing that we i wanted you to touch upon is your you have been not only writing poems so long you have been able to sustain yourself as a poet and most interestingly the coffee model that i, I you have the unique very coffee model that you have so if you can just throw light on that it's it's something very interesting oh yeah there's a button on the website this is buy me a coffee um i i i i think i drink more coffee than might be safe or healthy <laughs> i like coffee and and um uh, i wanted i just simply i wanted to give um teachers primarily a way to um a way to say thank you that just helps keep the keep the website going yes and, and, and that's what i don't make a, i don't make a lot of money i might i might get 20 dollars worth of coffee in a month something like that not enough to live on but yeah but yet it's it, you it does pay for the coffee though <laughs> Yes, that's interesting. Okay, so we are having a lot, many of these, you know, let, this is also, I think, so a chance for us to, you know, pick up a few of the questions that have come over the, you know, the thing. As, yeah. as I said, there are quite many fans of you that are there. You know, if you could just, uh, possibly you could quickly say there are a lot of highs coming on from, you know, Saba, Kailash Kumar, Kundan Sutar. And, you know, so let me take one question. So yeah, we have some question uh, from Vijayata C, which says, personally, I find rhyming very difficult. Can you give uh, some handy yeah. tips on how to do that? Oh, oh, I can not only give handy tips. Um, I have an entire YouTube video on just this subject, okay? Uh, about what, what rhyming is and wh what is not a rhyme. There are a lot of things that, that feel like a rhyme, but they're really not. And so I have a whole YouTube video. I have a lesson on my on the lessons page on my poetry uh, website, a, a lesson on how to rhyme. And as I mentioned, most importantly, I have the rhyming dictionary on my website. And from the homepage, I'm sure there's, I think there's a button right on the homepage that says rhyming dictionary. And all you have to do is if you type in cat, it's going to give you bat, rat, chat, fat, flat, and so on and so forth. So I would recommend if you have trouble rhyming, just go to poetryforkids.com slash rhymes and type in the word that you're trying to write. Okay. There's another question which says that, do you research topics before writing them? Uh, and do you read poetry yourself? Uh, yes. Yes to both. Um, it depends on the topic. If it's something that uh, doesn't require any research, you know, like uh, let's say I, I decided to write a poem about my dog using my smartphone. There's no, no research required for that. I, I know about dogs and smartphones and I'll just put it together. But if, if I were writing a poem about uh, say a, a city or a country, I might do some research to find out a little bit more about that city or country before I started writing. And what was the second part of that question? Do, oh, do I read poetry? I yes. love, I love to read poetry. Yes, um, I, I read it for uh, uh, for inspiration. You know what I what I really like to read is I like looking for po humorous poets who were writing a hundred years ago. 125 years ago, 150 years ago, because all of their books are in the public domain and available to read online for free. And so I quite often will go to uh, Project Gutenberg, which is a website where they make public domain books available and read. Um, oh, recently I read A.A. A. Milne, the author of Winnie the Pooh. Yes, of course. Um, his book, When We Were Very Young, is now in the public domain and it's available to read for free online. And it's just, oh, it is the, the most wonderful, charming poetry. Um, so yeah, yeah. And that's, I do. that's very interesting. You know, there's again the Ekta Batra. She's she's a teacher from Pune. I'll just say, you know, she she was wanting to know if how do you, how can someone touch base with you? How can they contact you? 
Oh, well, email address. You don't you don't need my email address to contact me. Uh, just go to poetryforkids.com and no, actually, may, may I just share the screen and, and show? Yeah, you can sure. Uh, let me see if this is going to work here. So. Uh, she has asked another question while while you are at it. Is there a story behind the Barracuda boogies in the deep sea dance? Oh, sure. Yes. Well, so so here is my website, and if you wanted to contact me, just scroll down to the bottom right here where it says contact Ken Nesbitt, and that will uh, provide a form where anything you type in there will come straight into my email address. Um, and Deep Sea Dance, Deep Sea Dance was a uh, not in, it, it's, it's quite different from the other poetry on my website. And that was in, intended to be a picture book. Uh, that was intended to be a story about, um, about, about judging other people by how they look or what you think they are like. So in this in this story, all of the underwater creatures are having a party, and they're yes. they're just dancing and listening to music and having a great time. And all of a sudden, here comes the shark. So they just scatter. They're like, oh no no, we're not going to hang around for the shark. Well, it turns out the shark just wants to play. He just wants to dance too, and so he ends up dancing by himself. And the other creatures eventually realize that he's not what they thought. And so they come back and they're, now they're all having a party. Uh, and and then and then here comes the killer whale. <laughs> That's yeah. That, you always have this very interesting twist in all these uh, poems of yours. They're like, you know, they're, they're like uh, what we, there's a very famous Hollywood, uh, you know, director of Indian origin, M. Night Shyamalan. So you have these Oh sure. Kind of, yeah, the, the twist or all you always know there's a twist coming. Right. Well, what I what I like about uh, uh, Shyamalan and his twists is that uh, when the twist comes, it's something that, in hindsight, seems so obvious. Right. You're like, oh man, how did I not know that was coming? And those really are the best. Um, I, ha I have a poem, for example, called My Teacher Ate My Homework. And it, it's all about the teacher. You know, he hand in the homework and all of a sudden the teacher's eating it and, and just chewing it up and licking off his fingers. And, and then the punchline is, well, I, I guess that's how they grade you when you're in a cooking class, right? And so... It's the sort of punchline. There's really no twist to it. It's just like, oh, well, now I get yes. it. Yes, yes. No, like, like I, I the, this one of the my favorite poems also was the one where you know there's a vacation that has been declared and everyone in the school is you know they're running. The punchline comes in the end and you realize that you know every one of the teachers and the principal, everyone are so happy that it's vacation time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The uh, the poem was the teachers jumped out of the windows. And yes. uh, the, the teachers and the principal and the lunch ladies and everybody's just running and screaming. As I, as I said, you can always improve a poem by adding some people running and screaming. And that is what's happening. And it turns out it's just because it's the last day of school and they're very excited to leave. Yes. The so adults, it, adults are. <laughs> yes, the adults, adults are more, more happier than the kids, I guess. Yeah, as happy as mm -hmm. I should say. Yes. So, giving that perspective, in, we live in today's time where you know the topics of uh, climate change and global warming are very much you know become pertinent and very very much the the news that you read keep, keep reading all the time right now. The big freeze that is happening in uh, North America. So, mm -hmm. do you think yeah. going forth, these are the kind of you know uh, motives that you're gonna employ or you know use or you know in your poetry? Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. You know, I think that, for example, the um, uh, the power outages and uh, and severely cold temperatures in Texas are an an, an absolute tragedy. Um, and so I I don't write I don't write tragedy, but what I but it, you know I may take something from that and write a poem 
involving the winter, the cold, the snow, um, maybe yeah. getting a week off of school. <laughs> but um, but I, I have to I have to tread carefully on absolutely, absolutely on that because I don't I don't want I don't want my I don't mind if a poem is is bittersweet, but I don't want it to just be sad. I, I get your point. So, you know, uh, more or less coming to an end of our conversation. I had some very quick questions for you. And if you can, I'll just sure. pose them to you and we can have it, you know. So what if I were to ask you, what is your inspiration? Wh whom do you find are the most inspiring authors? Well, wow. um, let's see. For the for the kind of writing that I do, I love to read uh, Jack Perletsky. Uh, I don't know if Jack Perleski is is as well known in India as he is in America, but um, but he has probably been my biggest inspiration. Uh, he's also a friend of mine. Uh, you know, we, as as colleagues, we eventually became good friends. Uh, another of my another of the poets that really inspires me. He doesn't really inform my writing because I honestly don't know how he writes such amazing poems. He is a Canadian poet named Dennis Lee, and Dennis Dennis was famous uh, for a book he wrote in the '70s called Alligator Pie, mm -hmm. and and so his poems are more like um, more like nursery rhymes, so a sort of a modern mother goose. And I I do have a section on my website of nursery rhymes that I have written. And uh, I, I think, in to, to at least some degree, those were inspired by Dennis. Yeah. Have you ever ever thought about writing poems for adults? Have, oh no, no. Um, uh, you know, I, I have I have written some poems that are probably more uh, probably would probably be more appealing to adults than children, but but uh, I think that the the adult poetry market. Uh, lends itself more toward free verse and uh, and sharing of emotions um, and that sort of thing. And it's really not what I do. I'm I just want to tell jokes, and I don't know that adults necessarily want to buy books of jokes in rhyme. But let me confess something. I I, I possibly enjoy your poems much more than my kids do, right? Well, I'm that's sure. <laughs> That is another thing, is I do try to write my poems, not only with the children in mind, but also uh, I keep in mind the adults that are reading my poems to the children. And so sometimes I will slip a, some grown-up jokes in there uh, that are going to go right over the kids' heads. For example, if I... May I, do we have time that I could read another poem? Please, please. That more than... Me. Okay. So let me, uh, let me just search it up really quick. I, this, I think ties into our discussion of nature writing very well here. Uh, the poem is called Don't Bother Any Butterflies. And uh, you, you may hear at, at least one ad adult joke in here. Uh, and here it goes. This is Don't Bother Any Butterflies. Don't bother any butterflies. Give ladybugs no grief. Don't irritate the inchworm as it strolls along the leaf. Do not besiege the bumblebee or set upon the fly. If a spider walks beside you, let the spider sidle by. Try not to plague the locust. Let the caterpillar pass. Investigate no anthill with your magnifying glass. Don't terminate the termite or antagonize the flea. If a beetle is before you, let it be. Yeah, let it be. If you should come across a bug, you now know what to do. For if you do not bug the bug, the bug will not bug you. That's so. That's so true. And yes, right. So, so there's a little joke in there for Beatles fans. Let it be. Yeah, let it be. Uh, yes. There's 
you know, I, if I say try not to plague the locust, uh, these are things that children, it, it won't mean anything to them. Yeah, for them it's just a phrase. Eh? It's just, yeah, it's just some words. But for the adults that are reading it to them, there's a whole bunch of other imagery that comes along with it. Very interesting. And you, 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 your, your poems are very colorful. So is there a favorite color that you have? Well, uh, as I tell children, my favorite colors are um, puce, ochre, and vermilion. But that's because I choose favorite colors based on how they sound. Uh, but then I then I, I have to when I get these blank looks from them, I tell them no, I'm I'm kidding. Okay. I, li I like I like green. I was I was just about to Google what the puce what color is puce. that. Again? What color is yeah. puce? You should look it up. It's P U C E. It's a it's a pretty color, but not one you would choose as a favorite. Okay. I like green. Okay. But I also <laughs> I love the sound of words, you know. And so to me, a word like vermilion. Mm -hmm. Periwinkle, you know, it's like, <laughs> I like, I like saying them. Yeah, I, I, of all, if, if I were to ask you, uh, you know, personal favorite poems, which one do, would that be? I'm sure you have, you know, scores and scores of poems. If just uh, mm -hmm. someone. Um, well, so I will tell you that in general, in general, I find that children's favorite poems of mine are either the ones that have a lot of action possibly even a tinge of violence, or that have um, involved bodily functions, right? Uh, uh, burping, tooting, uh, underwear, those sorts of things. For me, my favorite poems are ones that tend to just twist your brain a little bit. I like things that are that are self-contradictory and make you think. So for example, one of, one of my favorite poems that I've written recently uh, that will be in my next book is a poem called One Warm Sunny Day. Uh, and uh, would you like to hear it or shall I just? Please, please, please. We'd give, love to give, hear give, it. Okay. So One Warm Sunny Day. And, and this is an homage to uh, one of the poems that my father read to me as a child was a poem that I later discovered was called The Dying Fisherman's Song. And that poem begins, uh, on a summer's day in winter, when the rain was snowing fast, a barefoot girl with shoes on sat walking in the grass. And, and uh, my nine-year-old head just thought that was the, yeah, yeah. the most wonderful thing ever. And so, so this is... Uh, a poem that I wrote as an homage to that. Here is One Warm Sunny Day. One warm sunny day on a cold snowy night, the inky black darkness was sunny and bright. The evening that morning, that midnight at noon, late in December, one April in June, I stood where I sat as I ran, lying still, deep down in a valley, on top of a hill. The people beside me were nowhere around. The birds in the sky were all deep underground. The fish in the tree were asleep in their nest and watched the sun set as it rose in the west. Yes, that's what I saw when my eyes were closed tight one warm, sunny day on a cold, snowy night. Very beautiful. Very beautiful. That's, that's so that's so imaginative. It's, it's going to come in one of your books that you're working on right now. Yes, yes. This will be in my next book, uh, which is called My Dog Likes to Disco. And uh, that book will be out in April. Uh, and it will be available as... Um, as an ebook uh, and uh, and and initially hardcover and then paperback. I don't I don't know if the paperbacks this fall or next year. So, is this the first dog title book that you have? Uh, yes. Okay. So yes. So uh, for the cats. Sorry. I, I have to think. I have to think because I have a lot of books with dogs in them, and I'm just making sure 
Yes, I believe I it's fair to say that's my, my only dog title book. <laughs> so finally, finally, we have dogs also there. So mm-hmm. of all the animals that you uh, you know keep uh, talking about in your books, which is your favorite animal, if I were to ask you? Oh, easy. Uh, I have two two favorite animals. My two favorite animals are, and this is true. I'm not making this up just to sound weird. My two favorite animals are the wombat, which is an, an Australian, um, uh, yes. I think they're a marsupial. They're like a, yeah. like a large hedgehog. Uh, and the jerboa. The jerboa is also known as the kangaroo rat. And they are just the cu- cutest, most adorable things you've ever seen. They're like a, uh, they, they look like a very tiny kangaroo. Oh, very interesting. That's very unique. Okay, uh, unique choice of animals that you have. Yeah. So you know, you have you you, you confess that you have been in in this last year. You have been learning new languages. So how many languages do you know speak? Oh, this is my oh, first. <laughs> this is my first foreign language. Um. Uh. All, all my life, I thought, one of these days, I need to learn to play a musical instrument. Or one of these days, I need to learn another language. And the, um, you know, the, the lockdown just seemed to me to be the perfect opportunity to, to learn a language. So I speak English and now Portuguese. But my intention is to learn a new language every year from now on. So, you know, if I can speak five or 10 languages a decade from now, I think that would be fantastic. Why not? What else, what else do you have to do with your time? <laughs> yes, and that brings me to another question is what do what you actually do in your spare time? What do I do in my spare time? Um, what are your hobbies? What, are, what is your interest? What are your favorite sports? Mm, well, I don't, I don't play sports, but I, but I love to hike. And so, you know, every day I will uh, put my shoes on and go for a long walk somewhere. Uh, oftentimes what I'll do is I will put on my earbuds and study languages while I'm, while I'm walking. Um, and I love to cook. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I love food. And I started, I started cooking when I was five years old. My parents bought me my first cookbook because I really wanted to learn how to cook then. And so uh, this winter, this winter I'm living in Mexico with my wife and my mother-in-law. And we we all sort of take turns with with the cooking. So go for a hike, buy some fresh produce, come home and uh, and make dinner. And what's your favorite food to cook and to eat? (laughs) Oh, I don't I don't know. Um, I I, my favorite food to eat would probably be I I like seafood. So maybe sushi, something like that. Um, But when it comes to cooking um oh I, I don't have a favorite i just i just like to cook i like to chop vegetables and um I, it, nothing makes me happier than being able to spend an entire afternoon in the kitchen preparing something so i had this one final question so you have been you know kind of enlivening the lives of uh, so many you know, millions of kids across the world right your own kids, they must be finding, do they find you really funny or, you know, are you a boring dad? Uh, when, when my children were, were eight, nine years old, they still thought I was very funny. Uh, and then when, once they became teenagers, they d- decided, no, d- dad's not cool. Uh, now they're adults and I think they have a, a more prosaic view of what I do. You know, it's not to them. It's not that special, but they do understand why it is special to uh, kids because they remember, you know, they remember when they were in the third grade, uh, how how awesome it was. Yeah, and have any one of them taken up to poetry or that rhyme or something like that? No, uh, my son, my son who will be twenty three next month, um, he has. He, he, when he was younger, he did write some poems that were quite good, um, surprisingly good for his age, but it's not something that, it's not something that, uh, that he wants to do. So he's, he's got his own interests and, 
he's very creative. Actually, both both of my children are very creative, and but they're they're off doing their their own things. Great, great. You know, Ken, it has been a very great pleasure and privilege to be speaking to you. You know, and especially on this day, as I mentioned again, it's your birthday today. Uh, mm -hmm. I just hope. To find you know environment has become a very important subject and it's there in uh, its curricular studies right now. I, I I I'm hoping that we'll have a lot many poems from you coming in, which we can you know very subtly push in that thing into these uh, kids' uh, mind and you know teach them things which are very much relevant and pertinent to them. I will absolutely uh, keep that in mind uh, in the uh, poems that I write in the future. So thank you so much for your time. Pleasure talking to you. And we Thank hope you for having me. Time. And uh, I just have to say, I, I, I just want to say, I, just, I, th I think it's wonderful, this miracle that we have of the Internet, that, uh, that you and I are on opposite sides of the planet. We're almost 12 hours apart in, geographically, and yet we can speak as if we're in the same room. I just think it's fantastic. So thank you for having me. And... Uh, yeah, I'm, I, Thank I need you to so write much. some poetry now. Yes, bye-bye. Take care. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you.